What evidence is there, or is there any evidence uh, in the Constitution or elsewhere that the framers actually thought slavery might end in the years after the Philadelphia Convention? Well, the Constitution never mentioned slavery by name. And of course, the, the, the prohibition on regulating the importation of, of labor uh, into the country had a, a, an end period uh, in it. It was, it was only going to last for 20 years. So some people maybe thought that, at that after that point, Congress could, in fact, put an end to slavery by regulating the importation. Uh, so I don't know that people wanted to commit to the future of slavery. I think it was one of those issues that the, the more the framers talked about it, the harder it was going to be to do a deal. Because, you know, we tend to think today that a lot of the bargains in the Constitution were between big and small states, like the U.S. Senate. Uh, you know, small states got a little extra benefit and because each state has two senators. But a lot of these compromises were really not about big versus small. They were about north versus south and slavery versus non. And there was an understanding, that this, the, an expectation that the northern non-slave states were going to grow more rapidly over time and have more voters and overwhelm the southern slave states. So, you know, I'm sure some people predicted that slavery would ultimately go away, but exactly how long it would take and exactly what would be the triggers, I'm not sure anybody knew. What were the scope and limits of the powers of Congress over slavery? Again, the Constitution never mentioned slavery by name or Congress's power or not over it. There was a, a prohibition on Congress regulating importation of, of labor for 20 years, and that was obviously about slavery. But once that period ended, I think the two most important powers that Congress was going to have were its powers to regulate commerce among the several states and among the, the international community. So if Congress can regulate interstate commerce and international commerce, that's going to give it a big hand over slavery. And then second, the Constitution explicitly gives Congress the power to make rules for federal territories. And everybody understood that the, the United States was going to be extending westward, and the future of slavery really depended upon how it fared in that westward movement. Can you talk about how the country managed the process of admitting new states, uh, along with the goal of maintaining a balance of free and slave states? What compromises were made? Well, we're, we're familiar with many of the, the, the biggest compromises. So, for example, the Missouri Compromise in 1820 tried to preserve balance in the U.S. Senate by adding one slave state, Missouri, uh, along with a free state, Maine. Uh, and then other compromises dealt explicitly with uh, the Western territories and tried to draw a line um, uh, where Northern territories would remain free and southern territories would permit slavery, but all of those broke down in the 1850s, especially after the Dred Scott decision, uh, where the Supreme Court said that a slave owner can take a slave into a free territory and, uh, and, and live there with that slave as a slave, then any kind of line that you draw is not going to hold if people can move across it. Can you say anything else about the Dred Scott case? You've mentioned it many times, but can you talk in more detail about its significance? Yeah, so Dred Scott was a case brought by a slave, Dred Scott, who had been taken by his master from a slave state, Missouri, to Illinois, a free state, and claimed that having been taken to a free state, he was now a free man. And the case was filed in federal court, and ultimately the decision by Chief Justice Taney said that Dred Scott has no legal ability to file a suit in federal court because he, like every black person in this country, cannot claim to be a citizen. But en route to reaching that decision, the opinion by Justice Taney said that the due process clause of the Fifth Amendment allows people to take their property with them wherever they go and that the government cannot deprive them of that property. And so the owner of a slave can take a slave anywhere, even to a free state, and keep that person as a slave. That effectively gutted the Missouri Compromise and any legislative attempt at compromise. So if Taney thought this was going to buy time, he was exactly wrong because this kind of this highlighted that there's really no middle ground on this issue. So would it be fair to say that at some times the Constitution has appeared to be pro-slavery and at other times anti-slavery? 
Well, it's certainly anti-slavery after the 13th Amendment. As we discussed earlier, the 13th Amendment is very absolute in its rejection of slavery, and that's part of why some people consider the 13th and 14th and 15th Amendments a second constitution. Whether the original constitution was pro-slavery is a little bit harder, just because I think people haven't read between the lines um, as much as they should. Uh, slavery was not mentioned in the original Constitution, but if you look at things like the Three-Fifths Compromise and the makeup of the Electoral College and the decision to have an Electoral College rather than a direct national popular election, all of those things were done to accommodate slavery.